baby, we're back. Welcome one and all to 2023, a brand new year, and by that extension, a brand new season of League of Legends. Things aren't looking very good so far. Hey, you know what though? In times like these, the best thing we can do is to forget about the struggles of the now and remind ourselves of the good old days, looking back to seasons of League's past. In this series, we've already explored the early days of season 2014, the pirate-filled wonderland of 2015, and now we can move on to the insanity that was... <laughs> Season 6 was interesting to say the least. Many staples of the game today came from this season, but there was also a healthy dose of content that flat out doesn't exist anymore. Elemental Drakes, Updated Masteries, mm. Champion Masteries 6 and 7, Rift Herald, mm. Hextech Crafting and Mythic Skins, a multitude of mini reworks for mages and ADCs, mm. and of course, Dynamic Q. <laughs> What was Dynamic Q? Well, imagine for a moment if Solo Q was removed as an option, and all you're left was Flex Q, except it had no party size or elo gap limitations, and the role disparity it created got so bad it's the reason why we have autofill today. I can't possibly fathom why this only lasted a single season. Okay, from that you might be thinking, wow, this seems like garbage. This must have been one of League's worst seasons, right? No. For a simple reason, the champions. While arguably some of the most niche and least played champions to this day, I am of the solid opinion that season six had the best package of champions of all time. With Elawi, Jin, Aurelian Soul, Talia, Kled, and Ivern. And not only that, thanks to the sheer quantity of reworks with Poppy, Shen, Tarek, Rise, and Mr. Mori, season six skyrocketed to the most champion filled season we've seen since the early days of League. You know, back when they were launching half-baked messes every two weeks. They have their problems, sure, but I don't think at any point in League's history we've seen such variance in champion design and diversity. For my fellow monster and non-conventional body type enjoyers out there, we ate pretty good this year. I also have Mastery 7 on well over half of these champions, so you already know these guys sit pretty close to my heart and I have a lot to say about them. So let's not waste any more time, shall we? We have a lot to get through today after all. These are the champions of Season 6. Elawi, released November 11th, 2015. Damage type, AD. Roll, top laner, juggernaut, squid game superfan. He's about to get his soul sucked. I love the scream right before the- <laughs> This time a year and a half ago, if I asked someone who Elawi was, the response I'd probably receive would be along the lines of, who? But now, Elawi is everywhere. Legends of Runeterra, Project L, Ruin King, it's great. It warms my heart to see such a neglected champion finally get the recognition she deserves. Because for the entirety of her league career, let's just say if a champion's biggest form of counterplay is just walking away from them at a leisurely pace, they probably aren't in the best spot. And it's not like she's terrible, she can still get a big ass team white ult and smack her opponents into sushi rolls, but that rarely happens. The best thing she's good at is being a lane bully with her E, but even that doesn't do much damage anymore until late game. At least the vessel state doesn't last the whole minute like it used to. She's clunky, slow, and most of the time useless, so naturally I must hate her, right? No. Is it a guilty pleasure? Maybe. Is playing as an actually buff woman champion filling the void in my heart left by Vi? Absolutely. The tentacle setup, wave clear, AoE team fighting. There's nothing quite like it. Honestly, my biggest problem with her is that she's a top laner. And it's not just that I don't like playing top lane. The matchups, the tentacle spawn locations, and the ease of being camped make playing Alawi up there even more miserable. I just wish there was another lane I could enjoy playing Alawi in. Mid. <laughs> what do I look like, a psychopath? No! no, I have another secret strategy, one so devious the mortal brain cannot even comprehend it. I am, of course, talking about... Yeah! 
Yes, it's true. Elawi's Test of Spirit is deceptively useful, able to stack both Dark Harvest and Vigar's stacks of Phenomenal Evil. And Draven's Cash Out, but we don't talk about that. No! Simply throw out an E every 30 seconds or so, and not only are you doubling the rate of Vigar's evil stackage, but you are also gaining a Dark Harvest proc every minute. Does this work? Why, of course it does. It was proven and tested well over a year ago on Scooch's channel. And we all know how the saying goes. Something that worked in the meta of League's past is surely to work just the same today. Isn't that right, Lucy Mid? So, Lowey's a bit of a mess, but I love her anyway. It wouldn't be long to the next champion release, though. A rework, even. One I am decisively less passionate about than a Lowey. Poppy. Reworked December 10th, 2015. Damage type, AD. I think. Roll, top laner, jungler, tank. The first rework of the season and one for a champion that was in desperate need. We all know of the Poppy today. The bright, strong-eyed, occasional tank, occasional bruiser that won over our hearts with her shining optimism and unrelenting humility. The Poppy of old was very different. The Poppy of old was... Um... DISGUSTING! But hey, her entire kit had less text than Belveth's ult, so that's good, right? Old Poppy's ult was one of the most disgusting abilities I think League of Legends has ever seen. She would point and click target an enemy champion. Said enemy would take up to 40% increased damage from Poppy for the duration of the ult. Oh, I'm sorry, is that not enough for you? Well, how about on top of that, Poppy would be immune to all other damage sources besides the marked champion. This would last for eight seconds at max rank. So you can imagine, Poppy would run in, ult the support, and congratulations. She literally cannot take damage from any of the team's carries for the entire team fight. In comparison, new Poppy is a huge improvement. Although I'm not overly fond of being one shot by a tank who took Dark Harvest, because apparently that's normal. Her personality saw quite the improvement as well. She didn't really have one originally, but the new one too didn't really win me over quite as much as some other people. Listen, humility can be a good character trait in storytelling. It grounds them in reality, makes them overall more likable, and helps us as viewers to empathize with them, learning to deal with their own self-doubts and growing along with them as they gain a sense of confidence. For the most part, being humble is an admirable trait to have. You're not known to be a humble man. But I wonder. I think I am actually humble. I think I'm much more humble than you would understand. But humility also has the potential to be incredibly obnoxious. Poppy is too humble. She could come right off the backs of saving an entire village from destruction single-handedly, resolving a civil war, ending world hunger, curing cancer, and finding the answer to the meaning of life, and she would still tell you she's not worthy enough to be the hero. It's almost ironic that a champion made to be so endearing actually ends up coming off as annoying. Annoying, hmm? Reminds me a lot of Riot's next rework. Shen. Reworked January 28th, 2016. Damage type, Shen bullshit. Roll, top laner, tank. Shield bot. Okanya, I have an important question for you. Okay. Do you think Shen got a real rework? Uh, by all definitions, they marketed it as a rework. They did a lot of things that a rework should have, but they did not give him new voice lines. A lot of the animations are recycled, which is very similar to a problem that Aatrox has, with a joke at least. And yeah, pretty much Shen is not a real rework. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Straight from the mouth of the over 3 million mastery point Shen main himself. Shen did not, in fact, get a real rework, and as such, I do not need to talk about him in this video. So let's move on to an actually good champion shall we? Johnny. Jimmy. Jonathan? Jin? Nice. Released February 1st, 2016. Oh, come on, you were that close. Damage type, AD. Roll, AD carry. Sniper, serial killer. My performance begins. One, two, three, 
Fuck, guys, what do you even want me to say about Jin that already hasn't been said a million billion times? He's fundamentally the best champion in League of Legends. You know it, I know it, it's perfect. If Jack Horner's taught me anything, it's that sometimes a good villain is not redeemable. Sometimes the fact that they are so impossibly evil is what makes them so charming. I'm gonna wear your clothes! That was weird. Ah! And that's just it. He's so despicably evil, you can't help but love him. And this extends to his gameplay. You fellas know by now that I hate AD Carry, so it should probably speak volumes that Jin is in my top 10 most played champions of all time. I've been playing League for 12 years at this point, and not one once, not a single champion has managed to capture the satisfaction of a good old fourth shot. A clean and quick four. A phenomenal finishing four. A definite definitive one. Oh. Yes, Mickey. Yes, Two. Mickey. Three. Fuck my- You shot of a <laughs> bitch! You took my four from me! <laughs> This is exactly why I didn't talk about Shen in this video. Without question, he is the best designed AD carry in the game, and my personal favorite AD carry of all time. Ah! The only possible complaints I could really make about Jin is that his Legends of Runeterra voice, well, close enough to the original. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. From design to lore to gameplay, there's a reason Jin is highly considered to be League's best champion. Something that definitely cannot be said about the champion Riot released the following month. Aurelion Soul. Released March 24th, 2016. Damage type AP. Roll, mid laner, control mage, cosmic douchebag. Cower before me, mortals, for I am Aurelian Soul, master of the stars, forger of the cosmos. Now behold my ultimate move, the unbridled power of the universe. <laughs> Are you kidding? That's all the damage it did! Well, you've heard this spiel a thousand times. One of the most beloved champions in the game, one with one of the best designs, lore, and personality of the entire roster. Ooh. A literal god being wielding the power of the stars at his fingertips. And the result of that in-game is... He, he sucks. He, he sucks! The way I see it, A-Soul's a lot like an ability power based AD carry, pumping out consistent damage over time rather than burst. Just, you know, imagine an ADC with a hitbox twice the size, auto attacks you have to aim, and ones that turn themselves off every few seconds. And it's not like his past version was a whole lot better than this, cause yes, League Zoomers, A-Soul has already been reworked before. His W used to be a permanent toggle, he used to gain movement speed when moving in a straight line, his ult used to actually do damage, and his Q used to have a cast delay, meaning if any assassin got inside his no-no zone, there was nothing he could do about it. About it. Okay, that was a pretty good change, actually. Oh no! Of course, the first rework he got didn't fix any of his problems. In fact, it only made them worse, as it drove away the few dedicated A Soul mains that remained. All three of them. I don't know what to expect for his CGU, but personally, I would have just given him more stars as he levels up, similar to how he does in Earth mode. I would say this theory already existing proves its usefulness, but. I'm playing a soul and earth, so again, I don't know exactly how his CGU will turn out, but I'm hoping it does wonders for him. I love this champion. I only wish for more people to love him just the same. Hey, Nicky Boy from the future here. Uh, as I'm recording this right now, the ASOL CGU has just launched today. And while I'm not going to talk about it in depth, I'd rather save that for the Season 2023 Rewind, I did want to give you guys my short but initial first impression. To put it plainly, thanks to the CGU, I've had more fun with Aurelian Soul in the past five games than I have the past five years. Oh! <laughs> the return oh, skies no. just ended. Holy shit! Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Wait, no. this is a Penta. Wait, Tower Dive! Penta. Tower Dive Penta! Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm going in, I'm going in, I'm going in, I'm going in. Yeah, yeah, I'm going in, I'm going in, I'm going in. Get him. Get the Penta! No! You got it, you got it, you got it. Ah! <laughs> no! Well, that's our once in a million Targonian champion. And we wouldn't get another one until Zoe, nearly two years later, except, wait, we did get one. Really soon, in fact. The rework Riot would release next. Tarek. Re 
reworked April 19th, 2016. Damage type, Master Yi. Roll, support, the Guardian. The aspect of the Protector, the shield of Valorant, sworn to preserve beauty and protect all life. Where did all these corpses come from? Tarek has kind of always been in a rough spot. Cause well, modern day Tarek is this fabulous warden enchanter hybrid blessing the chosen few and guiding them along their path to salvation. Old Tarek was a gem wielding florist from another dimension. Yes, actually. And dude, I don't know. I have very loose memories of old Tarek because I never bloody saw him. Besides the infamous point and click stun, no one played him and all he was ever known for was his love of gems. Gems are truly outrageous. They are truly, truly, truly outrageous. I swear to God, man, some of Old Tark's voice lines sound like they directly inspired Jin. Brilliantly. A lot like Poppy, he didn't really have a champion class identity pre-rework, so the penultimate goal of it was to fit him under one. And they didn't really succeed. He's supposed to be both a tank and an enchanter, but he's a fraction as tanky as any other engaged support, and as for being an enchanter... We've seen a lot of players asking us to expand on Ixtal. We've also heard you asking for us to make a male enchanter. Well, I say, why not both? Sorry, buddy, I guess even Rad doesn't consider you one. There's really only one big piece of note for Tark's history over the years, and that was... The jungler picks Yi, the mid laner picks Tarek. Together they're able to clear camps twice as fast while also letting Yi take all of the mid lane CS. Now you have a Yi with double the gold of anyone else and a CC heal invincibility bot strapped to his waist at all times. Yes, it was just as insufferable as it sounds, but I'm not insufferable. I hope. I would never do something so deplorable as to play Tarek mid or funnel strategy for this video. What? I played him jungle instead. Only cowards would play Tarek support and babysit a deranged man-child. I'm a goddamn man. Men live for themselves. Men fight for themselves. Men go in! Men! At the end of the day, Tarek is... Fine. He's enjoyably goofy, charming as hell, and with an uplifting story to boot. But I think he's one of the rare exceptions where a rework came out half-baked. His popularity didn't really budge at all, he just went from having one champion class identity to a new one. Something he and the next champion release would have very much in common. Talia, released May 18th, 2016. Damage type, AP. Roll, jungler, former mid laner, earthbender. Open the door or I'm gonna throw rocks through your windows, you dumb whore. As far back as I can remember, I always knew Talia would be a jungler. I mean, with crowd control, AOE damage, free movement speed next to walls, it all makes sense. I just don't like it. It's like putting Swain in support or Soraka in top lane. Thematically, it's just weird. Speaking of thematics, I still remember when Talia was first released. I didn't mention this with the previous champions, but Season 6 was the year Riot really committed to expanding their universe by giving champions strong connections with each other. And Talia was introduced as a sort of Padawan to Yasuo, learning to improve her bending abilities while Yasuo learned to grow as both a mentor and a friend. It's basically just the legend of Korra if Tenzin was an asshole and the writing was better. You know what else is better? Playing literally any other control mage. Almost. I like everything else about her, but that gameplay, man, it's so goddamn clunky. There's some highlights in there, like blocking off an enemy's escape route with your wall or landing a predictive rock shove. And maybe with more time and practice, I'd learn to enjoy her gameplay much like I did with the racist pigeon. But as it stands, she just doesn't flow right for me. Man, this list is getting really long, isn't it? But beyond being a mid laner turned jungler, there is one very important piece of historical significance for this champion. And that is, she's the first and only trans champion in League of Legends. At least she would be if the writer's original intent made it through, but hey, at least we got a little bit of that with Star Guardians, right? And I mean, it makes sense. Her whole story is about carving out her own path in life and self-discovery. But there is something kind of stupid about it. The people who think having a trans character in League is too unrealistic. Huh? Like, this is the same universe with furries, space dragons, fish demons, blood gods, sentient eggplants, talking cats, walking mountains, real-life YouTubers, and liberals. Soda! 
but trans people? That's the one that's too unrealistic? It's just dumb, man. Kind of like her inclusion in Legends of Runeterra. No disrespect to the new voice actress, but... Problems should be broken up into little pieces. Wonderful. Problems should be broken up into little pieces. Wow! This is not Talia. This is Desert Lux. <laughs> I know I already did a bit like this earlier in the video with Din, but I want to make something very clear. These two are the exception. Most of the time when an LOR champion gets a new voice actor or voiceover, they're fantastic. This was just the exceptionally rare Legends of Runeterra L. Reminds me very much of the champion added to the funny card game late last year, and coincidentally, the one Riot would add to League of Legends next. Rise. Reworked July 13th, 2016. Damage type AP. Roll, mid laner, mage, infinity stone collector. Now you will understand! Enough! I will stand Enough. this! Enough. Enough. I must apologize for Rise. He is an idiot. We have purposely reworked him wrong. As a joke, when Rise first got his big VGU, the second one. I want my scroll. I was actually really intrigued. His lore is the secret savior of Runeterra, being the only one mentally strong enough to resist the corruptive nature of the world runes. His relationships with other champions all across Runeterra is awesome, and he somehow made Brand of all characters have a legitimately kick-ass backstory. <laughs> And let us not forget the combo-centric playstyle he embodied so well, cause yes, Ryze used to have actual combos. EEQ for wave clear, EWQ for a shield and movement speed, and QEQWQEQ for maximum DPS output. But now, that's all gone. There's no more situational ability usage, no more deciding whether the shield or AoE damage is more valuable. It all just happens innately. All you have to do is press EQ, 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 W. EQ, 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 EQ. It's another classic case of a champion being too powerful in professional play while being too weak in the depths of silver. But maybe when trying to make a more manageable and coordinated team play, instead of removing the actually fun part of his kit everyone enjoyed, you could have just removed the part of his kit that only works in coordinated team play. It's saddening, maddening even, to see a character stripped of everything that made them special like that. One might think by making a fan favorite poster child of the game this bad, you might accidentally drive its own player base to insanity. To the plan was a scheme devised by the Rise mains with one sole purpose to make Rise's already dismal win rate even lower until he becomes the lowest win rate champion of all time. Got some stiff competition on that one. And what was the point of all this? What was the goal? It's quite simple, really. If Ryze's win rate got that abysmally low, Riot would surely realize just how weak he is and would buff him accordingly. Yes, the penultimate goal is. Rise buffs. Well, that was idiotic. A lot like the champion Riot would release next. Cleared! Nah, it's just cleared. Released August 10th, 2016. Damage type AD. Roll, top laner, bruiser, maniac. If I see you, you need to die. I don't care about my life. I don't care about their lives. I don't care about my team. I'm gonna kill her like she owes me money. How in the fuck do you even come up with an idea this stupid? Let's take a Yordle, make him an alcoholic, stick him in the most un region we have, age him up by about a thousand years, give him dementia, an ego, an axe, and a two-legged lizard who despite being literally immortal is too cowardly to fight a toothpick. I feel like the mushroom juice cled drinks isn't even a joke, it's just what the designers were on while making him, and I am so glad that they did, cause who? Boy, I love this Looney Tunes looking ass furball. Spike Spencer, the voice actor for Kled, deserves an award for voicing a character who does nothing but scream and complain, but miraculously somehow makes him one of the most charming champions in the entire game. Now I might have overreacted. 
<laughs> he's a deranged lunatic, convinced all land is his and everyone on it is trespassing. He's aggressive, hyper, and dim-witted, something that is perfectly captured in his gameplay. Everything he has is single target and built around going in. His W is not activatable. When it's up, it's up and you go in. When he's dismounted, the only way to get Skarl back is to either die or go in. When he ults, there is no off button. When Klez decided he's going in, he goes in. You know when it works. Is he that great in practice? No, not really. The moment you have to fight a Ramus or Malphite as Kled is the day you'll want to game end yourself. However, if you're looking to just have a fun time riding around on a dumbass lizard while a cranky old geezer screams at you at how he owns every single military rank that's ever existed, Kled is the champion for you. It's a recommendation I wouldn't make for the last rework of the season. Yorick. Reworked September 8th, 2016. Damage type AD. Roll, top laner, juggernaut, split pushing menace. <laughs> Guys, listen, it's not my fault, alright? I'm just doing what Riot intended for this champion to do. It's not degenerate, it's all this champion's good at. I'm not cringe, this is what Riot wants. This is all they made him for, it's not my fault, okay? It's not my fault! I'm gonna say it, Yorick is Riot's least favorite champion in League of Legends. Right from his inception, everyone knew he was a mistake. He had the highest dislike ratio of any champion, although he's been dethroned from that title several times. His old kit was a goddamn mess, with every ability summoning a different kind of ghoul. And you think trying to right-click modern Yorick's ghouls is hard? Old Yorick was Teemo's biggest counter because the ghouls were so impossible to click on he would get harassed out of lane. You will remember Yorick Mori. Well, ain't that ironic, cause nobody played this guy, and what's worse, that same sentiment carried over to his rework, but honestly, what were they expecting to happen when they designed him this way? Sure, the new ghoul delivery service is infinitely more fair to play against, but ironically the rework made him even more niche. Now instead of being a fighter, he was a split pusher. That's it. That's all he's good for. And even that's subpar. The moment he becomes maiden list, it becomes about as useful as a fifth Toy Story movie. Why... Why are you making this? Money! And on top of that, his lore... He's pretty good, actually. The only surviving inhabitant of the Blessed Isles, constantly haunted by the Black Mist figuratively and literally on his shoulders, cursing him to give up his fruitless battle to reverse the curse and defeat the Ruined King behind it all. The Ruined King, though. That was a main character in his story, wasn't it? The one that started it, after all, and the one that will end it. Sadly, we know very little about this elusive Ruined King, so surely that means Yorick's story will remain frozen in place forever. <laughs> At last, the Ruined King is here! And with a canon lore event to go along with it, this is your moment, Yorick! This is what you've been waiting for! Left in the background for so long, finally it's time to put your story arc to the forefront and fulfill your destiny. Become the savior of the ruination you were always meant to be. Or just pawn off Maiden to some random weirdos you just met and watch the battle from the sidelines. I could not believe this, even after being promised Riot didn't forget about him in a story where he should have been one of, if not the main character, he was no more than a glorified cameo. I just feel so bad for the guy. If he's not going to get the attention he deserves here, in the storyline directly tied to his character arc, what hopes does he ever have of getting anything else in the future? Man, now I feel just as depressed as Yorick does. I guess there's only one thing to do, only one thing I can do. Literally, the fuck is your problem? Do you not like having fun? I did have fun. It's not fun to PvE. Go play bots then if you want to do that. That eliminates the challenge. The point is to team fight and have fun. You're literally not even a real person when you do that. I made the decision to teleport and win while you guys were fighting. Get a bot to do that. If it was ranked, sure, but it's literally a normal. It's so meaningless. What's wrong with you? It's what my champion does. Gotta do it. No, it's what you do. You fight. I play Yorick. It's fun to kill people, not attack the turret. I did kill people. No, you didn't. No KP. I had the second highest amount of kills on my team. Pretty good, I'd say. Wah! Four kills? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty proud of that one myself. Well, GG's, Corkster. Good luck in your next games, my friend. Maybe you'll actually win the next one. I'd like to point out this wasn't even a bit, this was a real endgame chat log. I think it just confirms that Corky players share as many brain cells as the champion does polygons. Ivern. 
released October 5th, 2016. Damage type AP. Roll Jungler. Excuse me, I think you mean mid laner. Enchanter, friend of the forest. The Vikings. Transport. Wood. All right, I'm going to skip the long-winded intro on this one. If you couldn't tell by the fact that Ivern is literally everywhere on this channel, he is my favorite champion of all time. Not only that, some of you probably discovered this channel in the first place because of me playing Ivern mid. And at this point, I've become somewhat of an expert at playing jungle champions mid lane, but Ivern is where it started. Is it the greatest? No. But is it fun? Hell yeah! To the point, I don't even play him jungle anymore. I just loved everything about him from day one. His supportive double team playstyle with Daisy, his lore with his redemption to becoming a better person, his design as the tall and lanky tree guy, his connections to some of my other favorite champions as technically he's Lilia's grandfather, and his personality is just so delightfully whimsical it brings a smile to my face every time. On the subject of his voice, did you know Ivern's voice actor provides a voice for another League of Legends champion? I guarantee you it's not who you're thinking of, it's Skarner. Don't say it. No matter what rework or new champion's been thrown my way, even if they've gotten close, none have yet to compare to the lovable tree guy I am not ashamed to call my favorite champion of all time. He's had his problems, of course, overbuffed to holy hell in his early days because players thought he was weak, even though it was painfully obvious he was designed with the preseason jungle changes in mind. Oh yes, I'm sure having a stun every couple of autos is gonna do wonders for a champion who literally cannot auto the camps. But on the whole, the only real downside to Ivern is liking Ivern. He is consistently in the bottom bracket of the most unpopular champions in the game, which means he gets nothing! No skins, no LOR card, probably no Project L slot, and not even a Wild Rift inclusion. We're adding a mechanic where after a few minutes of game time, killing the Brambleback or the Sentinel will drop a temporary buff that other players can pick up by walking up to the buff circle. At least he's there in spirit, right? But I don't care. He is still, in my opinion, one of the most amazing, fun, and creative champions in the entire game. And what a way to close out season six. Well, there you go. 11 total champions and holy Jesus motherfucking Christ, that was so many. So let's take one last look back at this enormous selection of champions the season six roster. The Cthulhu cultist, the hero. You're the hero, Poppy. When are you gonna get that through your thick fucking skull? The professional golfer, the galactic gecko, the aspect of <laughs> the block-headed rock bender, the blue bald, bald blue man, the redneck rubble rouser, the reversed ghostbuster, the literal tree hugger, and the one I didn't talk about in this video. There's a lot of glaring problems with these champions, but in the face of these problems, I cannot deny as a whole, season six had the the most interesting, creative, and unique package of champions in League's history, to the point where I consider this season to be the golden age of League of Legends champion design. But as always, these are just my silly, stupid opinions. Be sure to let me know yours down in the comments. What champions do you love from Season 6? What champions do you hate? And maybe which one of them you're hoping to get a CGU if a Souls succeeds? Whoa! <laughs> Lord knows a few of them need it. In any case, fellas, I'm gonna go lie down. This video was a bitch to make. I'll see you in the next video.